Um, it, it, and I, I know that this topic that we're about to go over very quickly, high impact storytelling for business, uh, how does it fit in with what we're doing here today uh, for this great gathering and we think about uh, innovation uh, and inclusion? And I, I sort of think of when we think of being inclusive and we think about the leaders that do stand at the top uh, that drive this idea of innovation and disruption and inclusion, uh, where are the voices and how are those voices formed? Uh, and if you just look at those with the Asian faces or those of Asian descent in the boardrooms across the Fortune 500, any guess here in terms of the number overall? You can shout it out. Okay, none. You're pretty doggone close. Um, uh, it's, it's more than none, so you, you can sleep tonight. Uh, it is about 130. Uh, what percentage of the Fortune 500 board uh, members does that comprise? 3%. Now, folks of Asian descent in this great country of ours is 6 or 7%. We got some work to do. Uh, and so when we talk about innovation, inclusion, and disruption, from the top to the bottom to the middle, um, there are some opportunities. And, and the question might be why? And, and that brings me um, to this idea that when we talk about those who've made it to the top, API does not mean Asian, and Asian doesn't mean API. I know I'm slicing bread here. I'm really cutting it really thin here, threading the needle. But that's an important distinction. When we spoke in, at Walmart, together. I just came back from Microsoft yesterday. Those are clear distinctions when we look at uh, 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 Asian talent. From the midsection to the every level to the, to the boardroom, those distinctions are very important in the way we talk about it. And it's not easy uh, to necessarily group them together or understand them holistically um, in any conversation that you had, have. So how do we get more folks up to the top? That's my question, right? That's just some, some sort of uh, a little bit of my thought on the background. I was talking with the uh, CMO of Apple, and she had brought, you know, up to iPhone 6 to market. Uh, and she was saying something about what is relevant to Asians and uh, APIs getting to the boardroom, getting through middle management, getting into to upper management. And that is that there's this question of a muscle set of whether we have that muscle set. Folks that look like me, or similar to me, or fit into that group of what comprises 56 countries if you're with the UN, 48 if you're with the US Census, in terms of what, mean, what it means to be Asian, American, Pacific Islander, or Asian. And that part of that muscle set is the ability to really communicate, not only personally our own narrative, but also the narratives of the business units that we are in control of, and or the organizations that we lead. And therefore, letting it dribble down into the strategic initiatives that we therefore derive from that. Now, the old days when I was in business school, we did not have a narrative for business class. We, we just didn't have it. But if you go back to the CMO, she said, look, the way we talk about business right now is through narratives. Strategically, when we're in the boardroom, when, I, when she used to sit down with Steve Jobs, that's, now, just because Apple does it doesn't mean it's the right way. But what was interesting is that then when I went back to the Valley, which I go back two or three times a month, and speaking with some of the CEOs out there, and then speaking with her, and she, she left Apple and now runs a, called West, you may have heard of uh, her company, and she's hiring nothing but journalists. Not only because we're losing our jobs, but uh, <laughs> she's hiring journalists because this idea, that this word we've heard so much, authenticity, right? How many times have we heard authenticity in the last five years? Is what journalists bring. Just like my joke at the top. Because we really do try to strive to get to the meat. And if you're in network news, as Tom knows, when you're writing those scripts, you cut out all the fat. You get it right, you make it impactful, and you make it the best in the world, right? And you, Tom did that for years on some of the most complex stories of our time. And so that's where she's going. That's where marketing is going. That's where strategy is going. I wish when I was in B-School only 15 years ago, we thought about it that way. I really do believe narrative and storytelling is not only essential to those who are trying to get, it, get to that corner office 
or into the boardroom from our spaces, because we're, we're really not good at it, I gotta say. Asians and Asian American Pacific Islanders, we're not so good about tooting our horn or getting the facts right out there in impactful ways. So that is, I think, why I wanted to talk about storytelling and high-impact storytelling. And the way we kind of think about it, at least over at uh, NBC News and what I've learned from some of the best I believe. Because if we're telling good stories, what happens? We want more. There's hunger. And so that's the idea. You know, it's, it's what gets that viewer to say, I want to Google that. Or I want to find out more about you. Or I want to get you into my business. I want to hear what ideas you can bring to me now, because you've just done such a fantastic job about telling me your narrative, or your business unit's narrative, or your business's uh, narrative. And then I think we'll be able to not only find the right leaders of Asian descent uh, for the pipeline, but also to get them through that ceiling, which whatever it's made of, uh, get them through that ceiling. So that's what I'm going to do for the next couple of moments. I got two controllers here. I guess they both work. Um, that does not mean you're going to have to split your eyeballs. I'm not going to do that to you. Uh, but I'll get straight moving now. Uh, high impact storytelling for business. And what I mean is, you've seen a good story before, right? You could be watching any of the nightly newses on ABC, CBS, or NBC. You see a good 90 seconds. You go, ah, that's good. Now I have to Google that. Well, I'm going to go through a top 10 of what I believe is applicable from that space to your space based on the background I just gave. So stay with me. If you have any questions along the way because I'm being too much about what we do over news, you just stop me and you raise your hand. You scream out, how, how do I apply that to what I'm doing? Or give me a practical example if I'm not getting into it for you because I will, I will definitely go there. But I do want to be able to get through in the time I've got uh, the things that we would like to cover. So my top 10, first of all, know the audience, and I, you've seen that before, but that, that is such a basic because we forget who we're talking to. Like, who am I talking to today in this room? I'm talking about talking to big thinkers that are strategic and practical. And this session is going to be a very practical session, obviously, because I have a top 10 list, and I want you to try these things as you go. Know, the, know your audience is something that we all learned in our our basic speaking class. The first point I want to make is, you know, well, how do I live? How does who you're talking to live? Because we have a lot of statistics that we always look at, either from Nielsen or anywhere else. But the question is, how is it that I put on my boots every day? How do I brush my teeth? Who do I talk to? This whole idea of psychographic analysis has certainly grown into something even wider. But still, you'll see, even in, in my industry, for instance, we'll be looking at numbers coming from these places that are still relevant, but not really telling us how does the, does the audience that I'm reaching live. Uh, what are my beliefs? Do I believe in God? Do I believe in no God? Uh, do I believe in whatever it might be? Um, and, and those, again, the hows. Another question you can ask is, how do I talk to each other? How do I personally talk to somebody else? What is that, those, those soft points? I, I put that up there because what I've realized in the scant amount of time that I have normally in meeting anybody and then interviewing them is about 30 to 60 seconds. And so if I were to talk to you and you're, you're sitting on set and we're going to dive into, let's just say, the election in France and, you know, I just met you. And I've got 30 seconds. You know, my most common question I'll ask to get a sense of who you are is one of two. Uh, how are you? Or what do you think we're not talking about enough? Yeah, <laughs> and see if you respond in a French accent. Uh, and, and that's okay if you don't. But whichever way you answer is I'm getting a sense of how, again, here, you talk to another person. And I get a lot of understanding about who you are. And by asking those very simple questions, I get a sense. And knowing the audience is important. You can have any set of questions that you would like.